We'll go ahead and uh, find a spot on the lawn. And there, again, there's plenty of room in the shade here underneath the tent. Let our setup team is just graciously provided for us each week. And we are grateful to see you guys this morning, grateful to be able to gather together as the body of Christ, as the Lord's church, to, to gather to praise Him and to, to worship Him. And we are, we are grateful for you, especially if you are a first-time visitor or maybe you've been here uh, before, whether you're, you are uh, new to town or you are just traveling through or visiting family or friends or whatever it may be, we're, we thank you for, for joining us this morning, for participating with us in the worship uh, of God this morning. Um, if you are newer and you'd like to get some more information about our church or ways to get connected, you can do so by going to our website. We have an online kind of visitor connection card on there. You can click on that and fill out your information and we can get in touch with you uh, during the week. Um, also, as you came up, if you didn't yet receive um, the printed song list, the song sheets, um, you can go over and see one of our greeters, one of the ushers. They can give you one. But the digital bulletin is still on our website, uh, the, the main website underneath the Cornerstone, hit, um, Cornerstone Happenings tab. The, the bulletin for August 2nd this morning is on there just with a few brief um, announcements for you if you want to, to go there and check that out. Again, just by way of reminder for us as a church, for those of you who are new, uh, just we, we go through our, our core values as a church every Sunday to remind ourselves of why we are gathering together as the Lord's people and really what we are about. The first core value, again, is the person and the work of Christ. That when we gather here on the field or where we're gathering in a building, we gather to come to worship and praise and glorify the person and the work of Christ. The second core value is Scripture. That when we are gathering together as God's people, we are gathering again to hear the very words of God. That when the Bible speaks, what God speaks. And we're not gathering to hear everything that we are hearing throughout the week on, on, with the media and the world uh, and our own mind. We are gathering to hear what does God's word say uh, to us. The third core value is Christ-likeness. But as the people of God, we are, uh, we are now in a, a process of transformation from the moment of conversion to the moment the Lord brings us home, of being transformed in thought, word, and deed into the very image of Christ. And that happens throughout the Christian experience, throughout the Christian life. The fourth core value is the one and others. That as we gather together, not just on Sundays, but throughout the week, that we are to be about other people and not to be focused on ourselves and our desires and our wants, but to be about the desires and the wants and needs of those around us. And the fifth and last core value is that of mission. That as we've been saved by Christ, we are now, we, each of us has the great privilege and opportunity to share the message of Christ crucified for us. That no matter where we are in life, whatever sphere, avenue God has placed us in, to share the good news of Christ with those around us. A few brief announcements. Again, more information can be found on our website about what we believe and really who we are as a church. But a few brief announcements. <clears throat> um, our, our Cornerstone Ladies uh, Bible Study, the last session is this Thursday uh, morning and in evening. Um, uh, and more information, details can be found on our website, cornerstonejh.com, for timing and locations. The la again, the last one is this Thursday until we have a break um, before the fall. Also, our wood ministry started yesterday. Thank you for those of you who were able to go out into the forest and to, to, to gather some wood. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be able to help those in need in our community, to show the love of Christ, to share the gospel with those who have not yet heard, uh, to serve those even in our own church community. Uh, we're doing things a little bit differently this year rather than collecting wood in one place and then having it um, having everyone come to gather wood, we are going out into the forest, chopping down trees, and bringing them to people's homes directly. And then we're able to connect with them on a little more personal uh, level that way to share the good news of Christ with them and to, to serve them um, and to come alongside them in their time of need. Uh, we are actually looking this afternoon for a few more hands. You can talk to Phil or to Todd to go to the home that we went to yesterday 
we were dropped off wood to 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 cut to kind of and to to buck up the wood and to stack it uh, for that family as well. So if you're if you have some time this afternoon, if you're interested, you're able to do that to swing um, a, a, an axe to cut up some wood. Please talk to Phil or to Todd. Uh, Phil is over here. Todd is somewhere serving hard over there. Thank you, brother. Uh, please talk to them, and that way you can uh, come alongside. A great opportunity to serve our community um, during this time. Our last uh, announcement, just briefly, is our Cornerstone Discipleship and Biblical Counseling training, uh, starting up in about a month. Uh, we've been talking uh, to some of you about this, and some of you have been asking about this. Uh, more information is on the website. We'll have the GC share some more info throughout the week as well. But starting September 14th, uh, we're starting a whole new year of training. Of uh, uh, Really, and this is open to anyone. Uh, any level of, of theological sort of experience or understanding, uh, where, whether you're new in the church, whether you've been here for, for a decade or so, this class is for you to train you and to equip you in dealing, uh, on a personal note, really with, a, with the issues of life. How do I apply God's Word to my life, and then how do I come alongside others and help them to apply God's Word in their lives as well? Well, if you have your Bible, a copy of God's Word... Go ahead and open your Bible to the book of Psalms in chapter 63. Psalm 63 for our opening reading this morning. Psalms is in, about in the middle of your Bible. So if you open up to the middle, you find the book of Psalms, Psalm 63. And as you find that, as you're able to stand with me in honor of reading of the Word of God for our opening time this morning. Psalm 63. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Thus I've seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. And so I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in my night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek my life to destroy it will go into the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be prey for foxes, but the king will rejoice in God. And everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. Let's pray to our great God. And Father, what a joyful privilege it is to gather this morning as your people, as your church, to come together to praise your name to exalt you, to glorify you for all that you are and all that you have done for us, all that you have given to us. And Father, we praise you that you hear us when we cry out to you. You hear us when we pray to you. That you hear us when we seek you. Father, we thank you for your great love. Your love for us in Christ. Your love for us in the abundant blessings that you've given to us. Your great love for us in all of areas in our lives. Father, we thank you again for your, just all that we have as a result of your loving kindness. And we praise you also that you are the only one who satisfies, are the all-satisfying one. That all joy and all fulfillment and all happiness and all peace, all satisfaction, everything is found in you and in you alone. We don't need to seek anything else or anyone else. Everything can be found in you. Father, we praise you for that. For being the all-sufficient one for us. Father, if we have fallen short this week, if we have sought fulfillment and satisfaction and joy in something else other than in you, Father, we ask for your forgiveness. Father, we ask for forgiveness of our thoughts, our attitudes, our words, our deeds have been done not seeking your glory. And we've been focused not on praising you, but on focusing on praising ourselves. Father, if that's the case, 
we seek your forgiveness this morning. And Father, we do thank you that as we fall short, that you forgive us in Christ. We praise you and we thank you for the person and the work of Christ on our behalf, for taking our sin, our shame, our punishment that we deserve upon himself. Father, what a joy and blessing. May you continue to grow us as your church, to love you, Father, to praise you, to be focused on blessing you at all times, to meditate on your goodness at all times. Father, we ask for continued help, wisdom, provision for a more permanent meeting space, a more permanent building for us to be able to gather to worship you that meets the needs of our ministry, that may be a shining light and a beacon in this town. And Father, your word tells us to, to pray for our leaders, to pray for our, those in government, to pray for the kings and princes. And Father, we do so. We do pray for them, the leaders in our nation, that they may come to know you ultimately, that they will seek the good of the people, that they will, seek, that they will understand and see you as the ultimate ruler and king of the universe, as the only true and sovereign one. Father, we thank you for those in law enforcement. We continue to ask for great strength and mercy upon them as well, and upon their families. We praise you and we thank you for doctors and nurses who are working tirelessly, long, difficult hours to help those who are needy, to help those affected with the virus. We ask for grace and strength to them. Father, we ask that you continue to keep us safe as your church from the virus, that you would allow a vaccine to be made available soon. Father, but more importantly, you would use this to draw people to yourself, to see souls saved as a result. Father, we trust in you. We trust in your sovereignty, knowing that you are in complete and total control of all things. May all that we do this morning be done for your glory and honor. Amen. You may be seated. Again, normally we would take this time as a time of, uh, of, of offering, uh, but we are still encouraging you to do so online, to, to be able to still worship through giving online, um, or through, you can mail in a check to P.O. Box 4943 in Jackson, or on our website as well. Um, and as you do so, just continue to, to remember that as you're giving, it's, it's not to earn salvation, but it's a means of, of thanking and praising and worshiping the Lord um, as we do so. And continue to pray for the Lord's provision for his church um, as well. Let me just pray for the offering, and then we'll have a time of worshiping the Lord through song. And Father, we do come before you again, and, and we thank you and we praise you for the ways you provided for us, the ways you, you have sustained us as your church, as your people. And we ask for continued provision, for continued strength. We ask that as we give, we do, <clears throat> we do so with hearts of love and joy, hearts of worship and thanksgiving, Father. And we thank you and we praise you. Amen. All right, good morning. Good news, we have song sheets this week. If you didn't get one and you'd rather use that than the downloadable bulletin, which is also available on the website, go see Ellie. Um, you can read off an actual piece of paper. <coughs> An especially sanitary piece of paper as well. Let's stand together. We're going to sing. As Matt mentioned, and as we mention every week, the first core value, not just the first core value, the thing that we value, but the, the bedrock of all that we value is Jesus Christ. There's no other name under heaven by which anyone can be saved. And we all definitely need to be saved. Not just from sicknesses, or mean people, but from our very own sin. He came. He took those all on himself, paid the price for our salvation, and rose again. And he is worthy of worship. So we're going to do that together now. He's saying, Hallelujah, what a Savior. He's saying, Man of sorrows, what a name. Man of sorrows, what a 
name for the Son of God who came, ruin sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He bore our shame and our scoffing in our place. Bearing shame and scoffing rude in my place condemned he stood sealed my pardon with his blood hallelujah what a savior we were guilty vile helpless guilty vile and helpless we spotless lamb of God was he full atonement can it be hallelujah what a savior Lifted up was he to die for us. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Let's sing that. Hallelujah. 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 What a Savior. Hallelujah. 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 What a Savior. So when he comes, when he comes, our glorious King, all his ransoms home to bring, then anew this song we'll sing. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Hallelujah. 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 What a Savior. Hallelujah. 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 Savior, hallelujah, 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 what a Savior. God, we praise you. Thank you for saving sinners. Why does he call sinners out of darkness, out of sin, into his glorious light? We're going to answer that question. Sing, you have called us out. You have called us out of darkest night into your glorious light. That we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ. May our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife. 
with boundless love and deepest joy with endless life. May the peoples, may the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. All the earth is yours. All the earth is yours and all within. Each harvest is your own. And from your hand we give to you to make Christ known. May the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not heard. May songs of praise build lives of grace to spread your word. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise. May praise the name of Jesus. It's our holy privilege. This our holy privilege to declare your praises and your name to every nation, tribe, and tongue your church proclaims. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. Let's praise him. Who is he? Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, worthy, worthy. The Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. All creation praise your glorious name. May the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. That is why we get to worship him. Our worship is not just based on a feeling. Though we are certainly moved by his salvation. We have assurance in his word that it is true. Seeing how firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? To you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. So he says, fear not. Fear not, I am with you. Oh, be 
not dismayed for I am your God and will still give you aid I'll strengthen and help you and cause you to stand upheld by my righteous omnipotent hand Even when through deep waters he calls us. When through the deep waters I call you to go, the rivers of sorrow shall not overflow. For I will be with you, your troubles to bless and sanctify to you your deepest distress. When through fiery trials even, when through fiery trials your pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be your supply the flame shall not hurt you i only design your dross to consume and your gold to refine that soul the soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose. I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Lord, we thank you that you speak clearly to your people through your word. Spirit, we ask that you would change hearts and lives as we pay attention. Lord, give us strength and, and focus. Thank you for a beautiful day to hear your word. Lord, we praise you for everything we just sang about and everything we're going to hear. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. All right, well, the kids can be dismissed for Sunday school. If you are 4 to 11 and so choose, head straight that way behind you for Sunday school. And welcome, everyone. The rest of us, go ahead and grab your Bible and turn to the book of 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. And a special welcome to you visitors. If this is the first time you've gathered with us for worship, it's a joy to have you. Thank you for gathering outside on a beautiful morning here in Jackson Hole. We are uh, in a verse-by-verse study through the verse uh, through the book, I should say, of First Peter, just kind of taking it one little bite size at a time. And we are in verses 22 to 25 this morning for our study. There are 168 168 hours in a week. And our Lord said in John 21 uh, to Peter and by way of application to the rest of the church to feed his sheep and to tend his sheep. And so we want to do our best to just pause in the craziness of the world and the insanity of, of life and just take one hour out of the 168 to feed on the Lord's word. Matthew 4 says we, we can't live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God that we would pause and kind of shove everything else to the side and allow our souls to feast as we prepare for uh, probably what will be another busy week, another trying week as the world tugs on us. 1 Peter 1.22. Well, if you were to ask the world around us, what does love mean? What does it look like to love? What kind of answers do you think you would get? 
what do you what would you hear maybe you would hear things like you know the standard answer sacrifice selflessness giving uh, feelings maybe a, an emotional experience but i wonder if you would hear things like persevering unceasing not dependent on whether or not I am loved or how I am treated. Enduring. Enduring grace, whether or not I'm the recipient of such from other people. Because there, I mean, there are breaking points. Sometimes you feel, you know, when you're chewed on by the proverbial chihuahuas and there are those quote-unquote difficult people. I mean, there, you, you feel like you want to shut off and you reach a breaking point. And it would behoove us to ask, well, what's that point for ourselves? What is that line? Where do we see ourselves drawing that line and reaching that breaking point? You know, I'll maintain cl a closeness, a pouring out of grace to this person until they, how would you insert that? What would you insert there? Often today it's, well, if you agree with me, then you love me. Or if you don't disagree with me, or if you never say anything that's discomforting to me, then you love me. Or if you join me in being all about me, then that's a sign that you love me. Otherwise, you no longer have my love. And in this, I think in this hour in, uh, of history, as the, as the world is consumed with many things, hatred being one of them, anxiety, fear, uh, lies, these kind of things, I think one of the things that God would have uh, be visible in the church and be seen in the church now is that we're not consumed by anger or hate or partiality or fear. We're consumed with love for one another. That love for each other drowns out all these other things that are saturating the thoughts and the words and the actions of the world right now. And that our breaking point is long, long, just like our blessed Lord's who died on the cross. Love. This is the concern for our next passage in 1 Peter. Follow along as I read, as I read 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 22 for our next section of study this morning. 1 Peter 1, verse 22. God's inerrant word reads, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. For you've been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. That is through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. Imagine getting a knock at your door, maybe by civil authorities or a mob of your neighbors and they say are are you a follower of this of this Jesus and you say yes i am and you say well then you and your family can get out you must get out and you say well where to and they say you figure that out Go now or die, you and your family. That is something of the circumstances that the original recipients of the letter of First Peter, what they were facing about mid-60s AD, when the readers, the churches, scattered around what is now modern-day central Turkey, received this letter. The heat was turning up in the Roman Empire as the even the government and the secular citizens, they were becoming more and more hostile towards the Christian faith. And so under that suffering, Peter writes to encourage them, 
if you've been with us, you've seen verses 1 through 12. Peter is just showering them with all the hope and the love of the gospel. That you don't have to worry if that happens to you. Yes, it will be very unpleasant, but by your faith in Christ, there is a blessed and eternal world where there is no death and suffering and sin ever again or persecution, heaven. And not by your works, but by the person and the finished work and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is all yours. God has generously lavished this upon you, not by your daily moral performance or how you are performing, but by simple faith in Jesus Christ. So he has just showered us with hope through these first 12 verses. Hope upon hope upon grace upon mercy. And then he turns a corner and verse 13 and on in the rest of the book, he says, okay, now we need to talk about what does it look like having received this grace? What does life need to look like as a believer, even if and even when you are suffering persecution as the original recipients were? That we don't put life in cruise control, but there, there are implications of receiving this infinite gift of forgiveness and going to heaven. That needs to, your life needs to look different. And the first thing that he says, verse 14 to 16, is you need to be holy, big picture command. And then the rest of the book of 1 Peter is talking basically about different ways that we are to, those who have put faith in Christ, of course, walk in holiness. There is a responsibility with going to heaven. And I think not yet believers, if there are any of you here, you appreciate that. The world appreciates that, that there are implications of receiving Christ. One of those in this morning's text is love. Love. And he's not talking about in this passage love for those outside of the church. That's a different sermon, and that is true that we need to do that. This passage talks about love for the church, love for one another. That though it would be easy and persecution in the first century and tumultuous times that we face now, it's easy to kind of grow inward and fear and, and, and kind of turn, turn introspective. He says, no, you must still keep loving each other. That is what the world needs to see. And that will, that will just ooze hope into the world and be sort of attractive. Love for one another as believers. How is your love, those of you who profess Christ? Love. Last week, we looked at verse 17 to 21 where there is one command there. Peter says, look, you need to have a fear of God, a reverence for God. Your life needs to be lived in admiration of God because of how great and loving he is. And to motivate us to that, he doesn't say, you know, because God's so powerful and he created the stars, but because of the gospel, because of the, the person, life, death of Christ, and death of Christ, the resurrection, there is also one single command in this text this morning. And I trust that you saw it. Love one another. Just a reminder, some reminders on love. Love, one way to define it is to seek to bless, encourage, and do God's kind of good to others, even if that means the expense and inconvenience of self. To seek to bless, encourage, and do God's kind of good to others, even at the, 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 the expense and the inconvenience of self. Leviticus 19 18, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Galatians 5, 14, the whole law. In other words, like every command can be fulfilled in this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then the great anthem of love in 1 Corinthians 13, without love, you are nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It is not jealous. It doesn't brag. It isn't arrogant. Does not act unbecomingly, does not seek its own. Love is not easily provoked. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered, how practical that is. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, verse 7, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Do you love your family in Christ? 
John 13, 34, Jesus said, I'm giving you a new commandment. And not that love was new, but a new level. Love one another as I have loved you, as Jesus has loved. I mean, that's the standard for those of us going to heaven. For by this, he says, everybody will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. And he's talking about love for fellow believers. That your love for the church preaches, for, the, for better or worse, witness. A deep love for other followers of Christ is an evidence that you're a Christian. It's a sine qua non evidence that you're saved. 1 John 4.20, John writes, If someone says, I have... Or I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen can't love God who he hasn't seen. Do you ever have those breaking points? That person like, ah, they're not my cup of tea. They, they ruffle my feathers. They're just so this. And yeah, I love-ish them, kind of-ish. I'll say a prayer for them. In what way do you need to grow in learning to love others? If you're not in heaven and you're not Jesus, you need to grow in learning to love others like I do. And that's the concern and really the power and the help of this morning's text. Big idea, sort of 30,000 foot level of, of this passage is that Christians must be characterized by fervent love for each other. Sort of the big picture of the forest. Christians must be characterized by fervent love for each other. So we're going to see, oh, four-ish, I think four helps for love. Number one is this. The foundation. Number one is the foundation of love at the beginning of verse 22. Number one, the foundation of love. There is a foundation. Peter begins not by saying, okay, like love more. All you need is love. He he steps back and he takes what seems to be a theological tangent, but it's no tangent at all because he's building a foundation. And, And that is how we have been loved by God first. He'll talk about salvation and he'll talk about it in kind of a different way than maybe we talk about it. He'll talk about it in the sense of purification. This, beloved, is the foundation of love. Look at verse 22. Since you have, speaking to those who have bowed the knee to Jesus in faith, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls. Stop right there. So he says, before he gets into the command of love, he's talking about this purification here. What is this all about? About Well, it refers in brief, and we'll kind of unpack it a little bit. It refers to the moment you put your faith in Jesus, that you are totally cleansed and purified because of that. Now, in what sense is a soul purified? Why do we need to be purified? Is that by our works? It is not by our works. Is that by the type of moral life you do or do not live? It is not that. It's something far greater. The humbling fact of human nature, and this is kind of the the dark backdrop of human nature, because Peter wants to paint, wants us to see a a, a dark backdrop against which the love of God will shine even brighter. The humbling fact is that in our natural state, we need our souls purified, not externally, but internally. Every human being, you know, he says your souls, every human being, of course, is two parts, body and soul, material, immaterial, visible, invisible. The soul is the control center of you. It, it controls why you do what you do, why you think, your motivations, your intentions. This is the part of you that exists forever and naturally it is not in good condition. Sometimes you hear today uh, nutritionists and doctors sometimes will say things like, well, food is best and healthiest and it's a natural condition. And while that may be true with Kale and strawberries, that is not true with our souls. In our natural condition, they are impure, polluted, defiled, and corrupt. They don't become that way. We enter the world that way. We are prepackaged that way. How so? Because we, we exist in this line of Adam. Romans 5, 12 through 19 talks about 
He says, look, in Romans 5, 12, through one guy, sin enters the world. The result is that there's death through sin, so, so death spreads to all. And the reason for that is when our first parents sinned, they, there was a, a shift in the soul and the, the unseen nature of all humanity, that we are corrupt in soul. 1 Corinthians 15.22 says, In Adam all die, the spiritual and physical death. So we don't become polluted in soul. We already are. One look at the condition of the world, it's, it's not hard to see the evidence of that even more. And we might say, well, how can we say that, you know, my cute little baby is naturally corrupt in soul, and I understand I have three cute little girls, but wait till they get to preteenish, even younger, or teen years. You won't have to be convinced of this doctrine. The fullness of our soul pollution might take a little bit of time to manifest, but we're a polluted race, the one human race. The criteria of that, well, what do you define as polluted or not polluted? Jesus defines it in Matthew 5, 48. You need to be perfect as God is perfect. Jesus also says in Mark 7, 21 to 23, he says, look, the Pharisees are talking about, hey, man, why don't you wash your hands? And he's not talking about hygiene or viruses. They're, the Pharisees are talking about the ceremonial things. And why don't you jump through these proverbial fiery hoops to kind of ladder your way up into God's grace? And he says, because it's not the works you do that pollute you, it's your own heart that's already polluted. He says, from within, out of the heart of men, come evil thoughts, fornication, theft, murder. You can even, Jesus is saying, you, you even have murderous thoughts. Fornicating thoughts is the idea. Sensual thoughts, evil, slander, pride. A high view of self in our minds. A, a self-praise. Self-exaltation. Jesus says, that's, that's pollution right there. And so we need to be purified, beloved. We need to be purified. We can't do it on our, on our own. Jeremiah 2.22, God says, Look, although you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, the stain of your sin is still before me. And the Pharisees, of course, they would try to, everybody can sense a, a guilty conscience at times in your life. The Pharisees tried to do this by their external religious deeds, which is why Jesus said, Look, woe to you. Pharisees, the hypocrites, you're, you're like these nicely painted tombs that appear clean and pure on the outside, but inside you're full of dead man's bones because you're not dealing with your heart. You're not coming to God for your purification. So the st stain of sin remains, but the good news is God deals with it. Ezekiel 36, looking forward to this, uh, verse 25, God says, look, I'm going to cleanse you from your filthiness and from your idols, the things that you worship that aren't God. I'll give you a new heart. And so that's what God does in salvation. That's the beauty of the gospel. And against that dark backdrop, the beauty of Jesus' love shines. Jesus, remember in the upper room the night before he's crucified, he, he's going around and he's washing the disciples' feet and Peter's like, no way, you're going to do that to me. Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus says, look, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. And he's not talking about a little bit of grime under Peter's toenails, but his heart. Only I can do it, Jesus says. You need to come to me to cleanse your nature and to scrub your polluted soul. Why can Jesus do it? Because he is the only perfect person who never sinned and had a perfect nature. That's, why the, that's the point of the virgin conception. Jesus bypasses the line of Adam conceived by the Spirit, so that He is the only unpolluted, unstained human being ever, being truly God, truly man in one person, so that when He goes to the cross, He can, in effect, serve as our scrubbing agent to scrub our souls clean, past, present, and future, no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of past you have. Jesus, the perfectly clean, through His death and resurrection, purifies the ragingly unclean by faith alone in him and his finished work. That is the love of God in Christ Jesus. And it's so incredible. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6.11, the Corinthian church was a rowdy one, and he's speaking to drug addicts and homosexuals and adulterers and thieves and drunks. And he says, look, you all used to be that, but when you just bow the knee to Jesus, not 
scrubbed yourself through some new behavior. You just fell down and worshiped Jesus by faith. You were all of those things. He says, verse 11, you were cleansed, you were washed and sanctified, justified in the name of the Lord God and in the spirit of Christ. So by faith in Christ, just looking to him, you're cleansed. And to illustrate this even more, a homosexual prostitute who is a heroin addict, a rigorous prostitute, a rigorous junkie, and a thief, the moment they call out to God and put faith alone in Jesus Christ, they are infinitely pure forever. And they are infinitely more pure than uh, some morally, externally speaking, morally upstanding guy, lives in a nice house, works a job, has no external addictions, but doesn't really, doesn't believe in Jesus because no thank you, I can get to heaven by my own works. That former junkie prostitute homosexual is infinitely more clean than that individual because it is the blood of Jesus alone, beloved, that cleanses us. And if you are in Christ, you are cleansed. And if you're not in Christ, put faith in him today because he alone purifies us. Titus 3, 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration, renewing by the Holy Spirit. Well, if it's not by works, why does Peter say in verse 22, in obedience to the truth, you purified yourself. He's picking up on the idea that believing the gospel and putting faith in Christ is a matter of obedience. But we understand that salvation is by faith alone. And it is God who opens the heart and draws us, John 6.44, John 6.65. And then we respond by putting faith in him alone and we are cleansed. What a beautiful doctrine. When you're in Christ, no matter what you've done or will do, you are cleansed before God. And this is the great love. This is, beloved, this is the foundation of, This is the foundation of love. That we are clean before God and righteous before him in Jesus alone. That's the foundation. Well, number two, the method. Let's look at number two, the method of love. Number two, now Peter gets into the nitty gritty, the method of love. Also in verse 22, the method of love. And under this point, there's going to be five sort of methods, five descriptors, where Peter kind of gets into our kitchen a little bit and, and really shows how high the standard of love is. The, the first method is, number one, family. Family, look at verse 22. So since, since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls, notice what he says, for a sincere love of the brethren or the brothers. So notice, you're purified, you're saved to love the brothers or the family of God. The answer to, why does God save us? One of the answers is to join God in loving the church. For a sincere love of the brethren. Now that picks up on the, this familial love. It doesn't mean love as though believers are your family, but love because they are your family. God saves you into saves you from sin and into the body of Christ to begin loving those he loves like he loves. Christian love is the love of family. And we have to remember that our, our biological family will only that'll only last as long as this life does. It's very short. You're not going to be if you're married you're not going to be married to your spouse in heaven. Mark 12, 25 tells us your kids aren't going to be your kids in heaven. You'll have, if they're believers, you'll have a higher relationship. This is all very short. Believers, the church is your forever family. You will still be family in heaven. Have this kind of love for one another. A tender love of family. When you come to church, even if you're a visitor here, you're seeing your family. You're seeing your forever family with whom you'll spend eternity with. Yeah, Eric, but you don't know. 
you don't know how so-and-so gets on my nerves and steps on my toes. Jesus died for you. And Jesus loved someone like you. <laughs> so let's maybe turn the wrench on that thought about so-and-so a little bit, shall we? This is your family. A healthy family stays together, keeps in touch with each other, doesn't pull away from one another, has a tender burden for one another, shares needs, meets each other's needs. This must be you if you profess the high name of Christ. Still under this, the method. Second is unhypocritical. Peter, talking about our method of love, says it must be unhypocritical. Unhypocritical. Look at verse 22. He says, For a sincere love of the brethren. Love is to be sincere. Do you see that word there in the text? The, the Greek word, the original Greek word given by the Spirit, it, it literally says unhypocritical. A love that is not hypocritical. And that word hypocritical in ancient Greek was a fascinating word. It was used to describe, to describe the ancient Greek actors when they would play a character in theater and they would put on a mask. And they placed these masks on because it was their profession to pretend they were someone that they weren't in reality. Mask. Don't, ma don't be a masking love. Romans 12, 9, let love be without hypocrisy. God doesn't save you for theatrics, friends. We got enough theatrics going on outs outside of the church already. Do you ever find yourselves being tempted to love other believers theatrically? Oh, I love you. Praying for you. But then there's no tenderness of affection. Saying something externally that we never think in our heart towards that person or about them. Paper mache love. Spiritual theatrics. Mask Christianity. Sometimes we talk about, well, you know, if I can't really mean something or if, if, or if like I can't do it from the heart, shouldn't I just not do it because I'll just be pretending? Shouldn't I just throw, continue to throw people away and just not pretend like I'm loving them and just frankly still continue to hate them in my heart? No. The solution to disobedience isn't more disobedience. Instead, the solution to that is to repent and ask the blessed loving Jesus' forgiveness for not loving that person and to, and to help me to grow in an unhypocritical love. Third, under this method, is the quality. Quality. There's family, there's unhypocritical, and quality. How is your quality of love? Look at the end of verse 22 fervently love one another from the heart. This, this Greek word translated love, is there, there's several Greek words that are translated love in the Greek language. Some are based on emotion. Some are purely based on sensuality or lust. This love is a love, it's the highest form. It's love of the will. It's not love of the glands. It's not a love because of that hinges on how you treat me. It's a love of the will. A commanded love. It's the love of preferring others. It's a love which lowers my opinions and lowers my preferences to defer to others. Which yields my opinions and my big toes. It's the love of sacrifice. based on Jesus' sacrifice. It's the love of, you know what? Jesus paid for all of the sins for someone like me? I'm going to heaven? I'm not in hell and I'm not going there? Though I deserve to? Romans 6.23 Glory to God, I will love you. That's enough. 
not going to be easily bugged by you. Again, but what if I don't feel loving? How should we handle that? Well, God is gracious to help us overcome. This type of a love is not based upon what I need to feel. I can ask forgiveness from the heart and love, a love of obedience. 1 John 4.19, we love because he first loved us. God is not asking how you feel. Like, obey if you feel like it. Oh, you don't feel like? Okay, then don't. That's all right. You can just hate people. It's a love of the will. A love based on his love. That's the quality of it. Fourth, under the method, there's a stretching in the method of love. A stretching. Fourth, under this method, there is a stretching. A stretched love. Look back at verse 22 there. The main command, the, the one command, do you see it in the text? End of verse 22. Fervently love one another. That word translated fervently, it's the same word that is in Luke 22:44, when Jesus is on his knees in the garden, preparing himself to receive the wrath of God and our impurities on the cross. And it says he, he was praying fervently. His sweat became like drops of blood. What kind of fervency did he pray with when he prayed fervently? That's the kind of fervency that you are to love other church members with. Especially the unlovable ones. And there's lots of them. The Greek word fervently, it also it meant stretching. It meant to be stretched out or extended. It, it was used in ancient times, the word to describe a stretched muscle, a muscle under tension as it's extending and working and lifting and fatiguing but still stretching and was, was working hard and feeling pressure. A stretching love, beloved. Is that how your love is for one another? Many times in the body of Christ, it feels like, man, I am being stretched to love this person. And I bet they have to be stretched and extended to love me too. Someone like me. Reaching hard. It's not the picture of relaxed muscle lounging on the couch, but stretching, working. Another commentator on this passage writes that the word is like a stretched string and a string instrument like a violin or a guitar. I can pretty much only play the kazoo and the washboard, but musicians tell me, and I listen every day when I hear our musicians play, that when you pluck a violin or a guitar, it gives that pleasant sound only because it's stretched and under great tension. And if it is not under tension it is, and it is not stretched, it doesn't yield a nice sound. Perhaps so it is with our love for one another. That the sweetest love, as it were, will come out from you when you're stretched and under tension and being plucked by the qualms and the imperfections of other people in the body of Christ. Maybe then is when you will yield your most pleasant, spirit-filled love. The fruit of the Spirit is love. And was that not Jesus' love for us? Was that not how his love was for us? I mean, coming out of heaven to, to, to come on this wretched earth and be treated how he was treated, to be stretched when he was subjected to great injustice, unjust violence, an unjust trial, and a totally illegal execution. And then Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross as his arms stretched and under great tension, were nailed to that wood for us. That was a love of his that was stretched out for us. And they stretched out his legs and hammered them into the cross. And he hung there, bearing the wrath of God that should have been ours. That's his love, believer. A stretched love out to you and to me. And we are called 
to be imitators of Christ. You must love other believers like this, and I must too. Are the, do, you have, do you have people in your life who are difficult to love right now, believers? Your blessed Lord stretched himself out for you. And if you feel like, man, it's a stretch, it's tension, I'm being plucked to love these individuals sometimes, guess what? You are in the will of God. You're in the will of God if that's how it is for you at times. How do you need to learn to grow in stretching out your love for one another? For some of us, it's like I begin to stretch and they might bat my hand a little bit and okay, well, I'm done. That's it. That's all the stretching I'm going for. Again, John 13, 34, a new commandment I give you. That you are to love one another even as I have loved you, Jesus says. His love was a stretching, aching reaching out love who think of some people in your life right now you might even write them down if you're taking notes one or two people other believers who are is a struggle for you and do you need to stretch out more and reach out to love them in this obedient way who is it It's said that muscles stay the healthiest when they're working and stretching out. And so it is with love. Christian, if you're a Christian, there is no place for the self-righteous game of, well, you know, I mean, they, I mean, they ruffle my feathers and we're just not compatible. Whatever compatibility means, it doesn't mean anything in the Bible. It's just love and get over yourself. You know, if this relationship is going to be fixed, well, it's their move because the ball is in their court. They need to make the first move. It's not how it's supposed to be. Imagine a tennis player. Imagine this with me, a tennis player who in every match, every single match, he demands that the opposing players always serve to him. Well, yes, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, at the 2020 U.S. Open Tennis Tournament in Flushing Meadows, New York. What an exciting time. And here we have Donnie Demanding. Donnie Demanding is up to serve. And, uh, oh, but wait, what's this? Donnie is refusing to serve again. Wow, ladies and gentlemen, in 35 of his last 35 matches, Donnie Demanding refuses to serve, saying the ball is in their court. It's their move. It's their problem. And he's going to sit there with his furrowed brow his curled lip, and just demand that they serve to him. What a sight, ladies and gentlemen. I wonder if we're like Donnie demanding in our love at times. It's their, it's their turn. The ball's in their court now. I'm glad Jesus doesn't love like that. Aren't you glad Jesus doesn't love you like that? We would never be saved and go to heaven if he did. Romans 8.39 Neither death, height, light, length, anything can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. It was said in John 13.1 of Jesus, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. It's a stretching love. Well, fifth, under the method still, is it's from the heart. It's to be from the heart, the method is. End of verse 22. Love, fervently love one another from the heart. Which is why Peter started in verse 22 with, look, you've you got to have a purified heart to do this. Because otherwise it's just externals. It's just piety. It's just actions with no affection. And God says, I don't really want that kind of nonsense. That's why I save you and change your heart and give you the Holy Spirit. Like Paul, when he says in Philippians 1, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. It's only right for me to feel this way about you because I have you in my heart. 
God is my witness how I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. That tender, soft, warm heart. How do you need to grow in that, dear, dear believer? It's a love that refuses to get jaded. That refuses, a love that refuses to be calloused towards people. Which is one reason why that command in Proverbs 4.23 is so important. Man, guard your heart, Solomon says. Guard it, guard it, guard it. Because you're going to be tempted to get jaded. You're going to be tempted to just throw up your hands and say, well, they're difficult and I'll just kind of slither over here like Donnie demanding and find someone that serves it up to me all the time that's easier to love. Guard your heart, Solomon says. It's the truest love. With so many imperfect people around me, though, how do I keep a softened heart? That brings us to number three, b- briefly. Number three. So we looked at the method of love in number two, and number three is the power to love. Number three, the power to love in verse 23. God isn't just asking you to like, okay, try harder, do gooder and stuff. There is a power to love for the believer the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 23. He says, For you, verse 23, have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable. And very brief, this is the great news of the new birth, the new spiritual birth by the Holy Spirit. When you put faith in Christ, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit comes to permanently and dwell in you, never to leave. And He is the power for this otherwise impossible standard of love. You can do this because of the Holy Spirit in you. Peter talked about this in verse 3, this idea of being born again. Born again is not a political denomination. It's not a brand of religion. It's the spiritual reality that happens to every believer. It means to experience like a spiritual birth by the power of the Spirit when you're saved. It's not anything you can do to yourself. John 3, 3 through 8, Jesus talks about spirit is like the wind. You can't control him. But once he comes upon you and you put faith in Christ, this is the power. The spiritual birth is the power behind these these new commands. It's also the reason behind the new desires that you have when you put faith in Christ. No new desires, no new passion for Christ, no spirit. But once you do, man, everything changes. The new birth is the spiritual engine for the imperfect believer to live out these commands. Well, number four, number four, finally, there is the perseverance of love. Verse, end of verse 23 to 25. The perseverance of love. So the text seems to take a little bit of a tangent here again. But it's no tangent at all. Look what Peter says, end of verse 23, talking about the new birth. That is, so the perishable, imperishable seed, that the spirit who comes upon you and will never leave you, he's not perishable. That is through, so this happens through the living and enduring word of God, verse 24. For all flesh is like grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which is preached to you. Notice this, the enduring and living word of God. What's Peter talking about? How does this connect to love? We'll get there. The Bible is like no other book. He's, making, he's using an illustration here. The Bible is enduring. It is living. No other, that can't be said about any other book. The Bible is living because it comes from God. The Bible is just as living as God is. Whatever characteristics God has, the Bible has because it's from him. There's no separation there. One historian has said we're we're to give God and the Bible the same kind of reverence because the Bible comes from him. Furthermore, it's enduring. Do you see that? The word of God is enduring, meaning it continues, it perseveres. And so the Bible, the word of God will endure to the degree that God does. Uh, Psalm 119, 89, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. 
So it's a, it's a funny thing, a severely misled idea, well, that the Bible is outdated or it's irrevel- irrelevant or whatever. That is an extremely uh, ignorant statement for a couple of reasons. First, the Bible speaks of the future. So things that haven't happened yet. So it's not outdated, it's post-dated. Second, the Bible is from God. God's not old or outdated. He's timeless. He's ageless. So he can't be outdated, so neither is his word. It's significantly progressed beyond culture in a good way. Third, it's ironic and arrogant for a mere human to claim that the Bible is outdated. The Bible was around before them, and it'll be around changing lives after them. Consider how long the Bible's been around. The Torah given to the Israelites in 1400 BC in impossible circumstances. I mean, they didn't have hard drives and storage in the desert. They had rock. And yet the Bible still endured. And then throughout Israel's constant history of war and upheaval and apostasy, God's word endured. Around 600 BC, Jeremiah takes his book and reads it to King Jehoiakim, 600 BC, Jehoiakim rips it, rips it out of his hand and burns it. He burns the Bible. And so God says in Jeremiah 36, 24, in effect, 28, don't worry, I'll, I'll say again what I just said. And he gives it again. And then post-biblical history in the early days of the Roman Empire, I mean, by law, Roman emperors systematically burned all the Bibles. That's why we don't have the original copies of Paul's letters and things like that. They were burned. But we have pieces of manuscripts from like 125 AD of the Gospel of John. You can go to downtown London and look at it in the, in the British Library. In Codex Sinaiticus, a full Bible, 350 AD. We have thousands of manuscript, ancient Greek manuscripts from way back to within a few decades of the actual events themselves. All of these thousands of manuscripts have a 99.5% agreement rate. The disagreements are just very minor, inconsequential things. This can't be said about any other historical document. The next closest thing would be like Homer's Iliad. Homer's Iliad, there's a, you can count on one hand how many ancient documents there are, and they're 700 years removed from the supposed events. The Bible is a couple, couple decades, thousands of manuscripts. Point being, the word of the Lord endures forever. This book is supernatural, believers. It's from God. He's not going to let it go out. And the more that governments and people systematically try to burn it and put it away, like even is happening a little bit in our nation now, the more God just spreads the thing into more places and languages. Because it's from God. Because the word of the Lord endures forever. And the people who try to put it out will be buried and die and go away way before the book does. The Dead Sea Scrolls, 2nd century BC, on and on and on and on. There's no ancient book that comes close. All flesh is like grass and the flower. We're temporary. The word of the Lord just keeps spreading. What does this have to do with anything? What does this have to do with love? This is what it has to do with love. Just as... The word of God has persevered in impossible circumstances. So must your love. Just just as scripture has endured through, I mean, all kinds of attacks, all kinds of impossible situations, so must our love for one another. This is the perseverance of love. You don't, We don't get to reach a breaking point as believers before you're going to heaven, of course. Your love and my love needs to endure as much as this Bible has endured. God's people must not operate under the deception that we can withhold love from each other, but be okay with God. It's a persevering love. How much, how much, question, should I persevere and keep extending and stretching love to this person? Answer, as long as the Bible has been around and will continue to be around. 
And if you fall short of that, like I do at times, thankfully we have what we're going to celebrate now, the Lord's table in communion. This is a high standard of love. We understand communion is a time to celebrate what the Lord has done for us, to cleanse us of our sins, to remind us that there is forgiveness. The guys are going to grab some social distance, clean, whatever, CDC approved communion elements and pass them around. The Lord's table, what, what's happening here? What isn't happening? If this is new to you or just a reminder that there's, there's no magic in taking the, the bread and the cup. You're not going to go to heaven for ingesting something. But nevertheless, it's extremely significant. The, the bread represents Jesus' body and the cup, his blood. Why is that? Why do we do that? Well, because as we talked about at the beginning, the foundation of this love and the example of love is in Jesus Christ. See, Romans 5 talks about how while we were enemies, he died for us. That's a huge standard of love. And, and the bread and the cup illustrate that, that Jesus initiated. Jesus died before we were born on the cross. And as we see this standard of love, even as spirit and dwelt born again believers, we understand that we fall short. And so the cup and the bread represent his body and blood, which are the price to pay for your sins and to cleanse us. And if you haven't yet bowed the knee in faith to Jesus Christ, what a great time to. This is a perfect time. And you can take communion for the first time meaningfully. All you have to do is cry out to God for forgiveness and confess to him that you can't save yourself, you can't purify yourself, that only the person and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ can make you right before God, and he makes you forever right before God, friend. If you're unwilling to receive God's love and you would prefer rather to go to hell than to go to heaven, you would prefer rather to, to, to continue in your unforgiven state than just decline and, and let the guys just kind of pass you and just kind of observe what's going on. But it doesn't have to be that way. You can just cry out to Jesus. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him, just believe in him, will not perish but have eternal life. And for believers, those of us in the family of Christ, it's a time for us to remember Jesus' great love, the foundation of love. But if you have some sin in your life, maybe it's a grudge against someone even here, that you're not stretching in that love. You're not extending in that love. You refuse to love somebody and you won't do it. And you won't ask God's forgiveness. Again, let the cup and the bread, just let it pass. We don't want to take unworthily and blaspheme the love of Jesus. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. You can just cry out to God for forgiveness. We'll give everybody here a couple minutes. The musicians will come up and play. Ask God's forgiveness, reflect on the great love of Jesus, and I'll direct us and we'll all take together.
Well, that night before Jesus was crucified, he took the bread and he held it up. I mean, he knew exactly what was going to happen. He knew the cross upon which he would die. He had planned it. Because Jesus' love is a love that just it comes to us, though we are sinners and unclean. He doesn't wait for us, tap his foot, furrow his brow, and say, well, let's see if you can get yourself perfect first. He died for us. And, and the bread and the cup are a symbol that it's just God. God did it. And when we ingest it, it's a, it's a symbol of faith. I receive you all the way, Jesus. So he held up the bread. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Take this in remembrance of me. Let's take it together. And then he held up the cup, which symbolized his blood, which was thick that day. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. He said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sins of many. Not based on our works, but his blood shed. We have assurance that we are right with God. Let's take it together. Father in heaven, <laughs> we thank you for your love. There is no love like that of yours. And we confess that at times we fall short of your standard. A love of the will. Love of sacrifice, a stretching love. And we thank you for the cross that reminds us past, present, and future. We stand right in your sight. Let all of us receive the love of Jesus by faith. And Father in heaven, help us to go changed and encouraged with the joy of God, the joy of the Holy Spirit, to love one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just thank God that we can hear from him, straight from him, his word. And though we are full of guilt, we go to his word and we, we see and hear about this Jesus, this salvation. It's an awesome privilege. Laden with guilt and full of fears. Laden with guilt and full of fears, I fly to Thee, my Lord. And not a glimpse of hope appears, but in Thy written Word. The volume of my Father's grace Does all my griefs assuage Here I behold my Savior's face In every page This is the field This is the field Where hidden lies the pearl of price unknown That merchant is divinely wise Who makes the pearl his own Here consecrated water flows To quench my thirst of sin here the fair tree of knowledge grows, no danger dwells within.
It's the judge that ends the strife. This is the judge that ends the strife. Where wit and reason fail, my guide to everlasting life throughout this gloomy veil. Oh, may thy counsel's mighty guide my roving feet command. Nor I forsake the happy road that leads to thy right hand. Pray this together. Oh, may thy counsel's mighty God, our roving feet command. Nor we forsake the happy road that leads to thy right hand. Lord, thank you that you've done something with our guilt. Thank you, our great Savior, for taking all of it, for paying the price that we could not pay, for shedding your blood, for forgiveness for us. Uh, We praise you for your word that is living and enduring. May we um, obey it. May we obey you as long as it is living and enduring, as long as you cause us to live. Thank you that we have the hope of heaven to look forward to. May we live like that here on earth now. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, amen. Thank you all for worshiping the Lord with us this morning. It's a joy, again, just to worship and be outside gathering together. Uh, just by way of reminder, as we mentioned um, in, a, in a, an email and an elder update and a video this last week, we will continue to meet here throughout the month of August outside, weather permitting. And then after that, we'll be inside at uh, the Lodge Conference Center. More details on that coming uh, in a few weeks. Um, also, by way of reminder, if you're able to help Phil and Todd and a few other guys to help to, to kind of cut up some wood and stack it, Please see them after the service. They'll be kind of up here. And if you have any, any needs, any prayers, if you need to be saved, you want to have any questions about the service, please feel free to come up and, and talk to us. A few of us will be up here willing uh, to talk to you. Um, let me just leave you with a, a benediction from 1 Corinthians 16, 30, uh, 23 and 24. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. May love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. You guys are dismissed. We'll see you next week.